This is AutoLine Daily reporting on all aspects of the global automotive industry. The federal investigation into corruption at the UAW took another step closer to snagging the president of the union, Gary Jones. The Detroit News reports that Jones and one of his aides embezzled $700,000 and split it between themselves. It also reports that former union president Dennis Williams embezzled more than $1.5 million. So far, the UAW has officially supported Jones and Williams, but outside labor experts say that once members ratify labor contracts with Ford and FCA, Gary Jones will probably be asked to step down. Meanwhile, we're learning a few of the details of Ford's new labor contract. UAW workers will get a $9,000 signing bonus, while temporary workers will get $3,500. Surprisingly, the contract allows Ford to close its engine plant in Romeo, Michigan. That will result in about 600 workers being offered jobs at other plants or being offered a buyout package. Nonetheless, media reports say that workers at the plant were shocked to learn the news. We've also got some details on how GM plans to offset the higher labor costs from its new labor contract. GM will reduce the complexity of options and trim levels. It's going to do a better job of designing vehicles for easier assembly and manufacturing, and it's going to reuse more components rather than redesign them. GM also has a new quality program called Built-in Quality Level 4. That means better first time through quality, with fewer vehicles needing any repair or rework. Analysts estimate that the new labor contract will cost $100 million more the first year, rising to $350 million a year more by 2023. But General Motors says it is confident it can offset those higher labor costs. Motorcycle riders are vulnerable. That's why an Israeli startup called Ride Vision created a low cost solution which can be retrofitted to bikes. Called Collision Aversion Technology, it uses standard wide angle cameras and a predictive algorithm to highlight potential threats to the motorcyclist. If one is detected, the system alerts the driver with visual and audio warnings. This is the first predictive system specifically for motorcycles to ever hit the market. Ride Vision also recently partnered with an Italian insurance company to offer discounts to riders who equip the system on their bikes. Automotive designer Henrik Fisker is back at it. He revealed more about his upcoming SUV called The Ocean. Fisker says he wants to cut the high cost of ownership and will offer a flexible lease deal through a mobile app which launches on November 27th, even though production of the Ocean will not start until the end of 2021. Fisker will also handle all the service and maintenance. The Ocean features a roughly 80 kilowatt hour battery pack with a range estimated between 250 and 300 miles. A solar panel on the roof adds up to a thousand miles of range, but that's per year. A unique aspect of the vehicle is a fixed hood, which cuts down on the cost needed for sealing and latches. Under the hood is a lot of the electronics and the air conditioning unit, which will open up more interior space. The Ocean will be roughly the size of a Ford Escape or Chevy Equinox, and Fisker is aiming for a starting price of under $40,000. Automakers often show off SEMA concepts that we wish they'd actually make, And here's another one of those. Created by Rockstar, this Kona has been given a Baja-style vibe with yellow rally wheels, 30-inch Mickey Thompson tires, and suspension upgrades by King. Ford also showed off a number of Mustangs and F-150s that it will have at SEMA, and that kicks off on November 5th in Las Vegas. Team Chevy is going to replace its NASCAR Camaro ZL1 with a Camaro ZL1 1LE for the 2020 Cup Series. 
Chevy created a track-themed monster by adding on to the existing ZL1, so it's no wonder it's modeling the next cup car after it. The production and road legal 1LE gets an upgraded aero kit and drops by 50 pounds. Vehicle safety is too male-focused, and it's putting women at risk. That's the conclusion of a recent Consumer Report story. Men are currently represented by a 5-foot, 9-inch, 171-pound crash test dummy that was first standardized in the 1970s and was a reflection of the average male of that time. A female dummy wasn't even added until 2003, and it's a scaled-down version of the male dummy, as well as only representing the smallest 5% of women by mid-70s standards. What's more, the female dummy only sits in the driver's seat for some side crash tests. The rest of the time, it sits as a passenger or isn't even used at all. The design of vehicle structures are influenced by safety testing, and because women are not a focus, they're put at greater risk during crashes. A study from NHTSA shows that women wearing a seatbelt are 17% more likely to be killed in a crash than a man. And another study from the University of Virginia found that seatbelt wearing women have 73% greater odds of being injured in a front crash than a man. And we say it's time for a change. Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Dana, people finding a better way. GM and Ford are taking a very different approach when it comes to the type of powertrains powering their autonomous vehicles. Ford's using hybrids because of the amount of electricity needed to run the technology. GM, on the other hand, is using all-electric bolts for its cruise ride-hailing service once that launches. So which approach is going to win out? Recently on AutoLine This Week, we were joined by two experts on autonomous technology, and here's what they had to say. I mean, right, right now, the autonomous systems are a big draw, right? When you, when you look at the, the cars that are on the road, if you open the truck, I mean, there's racks of servers handling, handling all of the different, all of the different uh, communications, right? When you look at a car that has eight cameras and 10 radars and five LIDARs, that, that's a lot of computing power that has to happen. And so, I think it'll be a hybrid, um, you know, but, but Tesla's out there doing a full electric. So Tesla too, it's, right. uh, it's, uh, I'm not 100% sure which, which way it's going to go. In my opinion, you're talking about a two and a half kilowatt or three kilowatt system just for the compute. It's just, I mean, that's a lot of power for a vehicle. Everything I've seen, honestly speaking, John, the deployment is really tied to some sort of uh, sustainability vehicle. So it's not going to be an ICE vehicle for sure. Mm -hmm. And more than likely it will be an electric vehicle. And the synergy there is good because you have a BEV running on a 400 volt, up to 800 volt battery. And then you have the conversions in place to support these systems. Uh, to me, that is the synergy there. And then you have another aspect, which is when the vehicle is totally electric, it's easier to control from an autonomous perspective, right? Because everything is drive-by-wire, and all these outputs that are coming out of the compute to say steer this way or brake that way, it cannot be your traditional system, right? It has to be a electric-based system. So I see a synergy between EVs and AVs, and we, we expect that to be our future, really, both. You can watch that entire show on our website, autoline.tv or you can find it on our YouTube channel. Okay, now it's time for You Said It, where I respond to some of your comments. And a few of you accused us of anti-Tesla bias when we reported that Tesla's third quarter earnings dropped. Dave Barinsky says, more Tesla FUD. Ignorance or intentionally misleading? Sure, U.S. sales declined between 3Q19 and a year ago, no Model 3s were being shipped to Europe or China a year ago, so all production was sold in North America. Now, all production is being sold but split between multiple continents. Obviously, that will result in lower U.S. sales. Very poor reporting, AutoLine. Well, Dave, you make a good point. Tesla has boosted sales overall. And you're right, it did ship cars to China and Europe. But we also believe it had to. This all suggests that demand in the U.S. is softening. 
We'll get a clearer story of what's going on once Tesla opens its assembly plant in Shanghai and no longer has to divert U.S. made cars to China. And J.J. is of the same mind. Poor journalism on Tesla, he says. The reason Tesla's revenue dropped in the U.S. is because they were shipping cars to other markets. They are selling every single car they can make. Demand is massive in every market for the Model 3. Well, actually, Tesla's revenue did not just drop in the U.S. Its total revenue, globally, dropped by $776 million. So how did Tesla manage to post a profit even though revenue dropped? Well, it cut its selling expenses by closing stores. It cut administrative costs, partly with layoffs. And it cut how much money it spends on research and development. Even though that helped, its operating profit dropped 37 percent and its net profit dropped 40 percent. And Lawnmower Dude is still very bullish on Tesla. Tesla will sell more in the USA once they have a small SUV like the Y available, he says, the most popular segment. And you know, you're right, we agree. With more models in its lineup, Tesla has a better chance of appealing to more customers, especially in the crossover segment. The only question is, how many sales will the Y steal from the three? Total sales will go up, but there will be some cannibalization. Hey, thanks for all of you who participate in the comment section on the AutoLine website and on our YouTube channel. We really appreciate getting your feedback. But anyway, that brings us to the end of today's report. Thanks for watching and have a great weekend. Wards is the industry leader for news, data, and analysis. That's why companies across the globe subscribe to our premium service, maybe even your own. Log in for subscriber access now. Check your company's intranet for details and rely on wardsauto.com to keep you informed.